Welcome to another video. Tonight we have 10 stories, from stories of strange rental homes, the paranormal, and much more. If you have a story of your own, it can be sent to reddit.com slash r slash slumber reads. These videos do take me quite a bit of time to create, so if you're feeling generous, and if you feel this video is worth one, please be sure to drop a like rating. It helps the channel more than most think. Subscribing if you're new is also greatly appreciated. Enjoy the video, and as always, I hope you all have a great night. Living out of my beat-up Ford hatchback had finally taken its toll on me. The constant neck pain and intrusions from the denizens of rest stops had finally taken my last ounce of patience. My infinite stubbornness had finally given way to a desire for some creature comforts. So I hopped on my phone and looked for local homes for rent. As I browsed through the listings, I thought back on my cheating ex who had laid claim to our mutual apartment. I felt angry and frustrated by the whole thing, and on some level, I had internalized all that pain. Part of me didn't feel like I deserved an apartment, I felt like less than dirt, and I could hold on to bad feelings like no one else. After finding a few listings, I started my car and started heading to town. I passed through the day like a ghost, allowing overly perky salespeople to serenade me with the song of their people. I half paid attention to shitty slumlords as the dollar signs flashed behind their eyes. Each new abode either not catching my eye or being completely disgusting. The last listing was a small home for rent, nestled near the edge of the town's forest. The little old lady who seemed nice enough monotonously showed me around a completely furnished home. Her disaffected tone resonated well with my current mood, as did the house. It seemed to lack the natural light other places did, and the darkness of the abode matched my current perspective on the world. After she showed me around, she ushered me to the kitchen table and pulled out some papers. So what do you think? She asked in a haggard voice. I think I like it. I replied, dreading the next part. So what's the wait time to get in? Oh, no wait time at all. Just first and last month's rent, and a signature, and you can move in today. She said, waving a hand dismissively. As long as you pay every month, I won't bother you, and you can do as you please. So no rules about pets or smoking? I asked quizzically. The only rule I have is don't feed the cat. The words rattled in my head. Was there a cat here? Had I missed that? Why weren't my allergies bothering me if there was a cat? Is there a cat on the premises? I asked. I really can't be around cats. I'm terribly allergic to them. That shouldn't be an issue. So it's hypoallergenic? Well, it's hardly ever around, and most tenants haven't complained about it. She said with a slight smile. Well, the price is right. I would really like to sleep in a bed tonight, so I guess I accept your terms. I said, sliding the papers towards myself to sign. And all the furniture comes with the rental? Absolutely, dear. I slid the papers back to her and removed my money clip. I counted out a thousand for the first and last month's rent, then removed another thousand dollars to pay up a couple of extra months in advance. She greedily scooped up the money and double-checked my signature. This all looks in order. I think this will be a great place for you. She sniffed the bills I had handed her. And don't worry about anyone bothering you here. Cops never come around, so no one should impede on your business. I gave her a sideways look. Somewhat shocked by this statement. Did my money really smell that much like weed? I tried to quickly think of an excuse as she began to laugh. Don't worry, honey. Your secrets are safe with me. My grandson lives in Michigan, and he has a similar career. 
The government should honestly fuck off about this stuff. She placed the keys for the house on the counter and started heading towards the door. Then she turned, giving me a very serious look. Remember my one rule, kiddo. Don't feed that fucking cat. After she drove away, I went to my car and started unloading the few things I had into the living room. I took my bag of clothing and my laptop bag to the bedroom. The room was larger than I expected with a marvelous king-sized bed. The blackout curtains across the window were a nice touch, too. I tossed my laptop onto the bed and hastily plugged it into an outlet. Once it had powered on, I went back to the living room to fetch my cigarettes, a joint, and an ashtray. I jumped into the bed and embraced my first taste of luxury in weeks. I buried myself in the slightly musty sheets and allowed myself to relax for the first time in weeks. Then I turned to the laptop and was surprised to find a Wi-Fi connection. I guess the place came with that too. Things were looking up. For the next couple of hours, I mindlessly watched nonsense on YouTube and got high. Eventually, I ordered some food. And after eating a gratuitous amount of Chinese food, I allowed myself to fall into the comfortable blackness of sleep. I awoke sometime later that night with a fierce need to empty my bladder. I quickly rushed to the bathroom but stopped halfway down the narrow hallway to the door. What was once a white wooden door was now a rusted metal door with a small grate at the top of it. I was taken aback by this. Had I not noticed it properly before, had a fallen victim to the fabled reefer madness. As I stood there contemplating my environmental awareness and sanity, I heard a muffled meowing of a cat. Without thinking, I went and opened the rusted door and flicked on the light. Sitting atop the peeling paint of the windowsill was a cat. Well, I say cat. That description isn't quite right. What was staring back at me were two luminous yellow eyes, definitely cat-shaped. It had the general features of a sphinx cat, but its body was missing spaces. One of its ears floated slightly off its head, which also floated a few inches off its neck. Its legs and tail also had several gaps where flesh should be. The gaps in its form, though, didn't bleed. They didn't look like injuries. They just were parts the form didn't have. I stood motionless, heart beating out of my chest as it stared at me. I had never seen anything quite like this thing. It had an overall appearance of being wrong. Something about it shook me deep inside like I was gazing into something that shouldn't be. Then it yawned and curled up, finally breaking eye contact with me after what felt like a lifetime. I turned to leave the room, deciding pissing in the kitchen sink was a more favorable option. Then I heard a melodic voice from behind me. Oh, please don't do that, it said. What a disgusting habit to start. I promise I don't bite. I turned to see the cat-like shape which had begun glaring at me again. Did you just talk? I stammered out. Yeah, I was waiting for you to say something, but I got bored of waiting. The voice was coming from the cat, but it did not move its lips. Well, no offense, but you do look like a nightmare. I blurted out. Why is that? It said, narrowing its eyes. You're missing parts. The cat-like creature looked itself over and then made a motion that seemed to be a shrug. Have you considered that maybe other cats have too many parts? No, I hadn't considered that because I'm not insane. You're pretty close-minded for a pothead, it said casually. I know you have to urinate. Please feel free to do your business. I crept over to the toilet and began to pull down my underwear. Then I noticed the cat was still watching me. Um, would you please mind looking away? I asked sheepishly, You hairless apes are such prudes. I said with a sigh before turning to the window. I cautiously relieved myself and hastily backed away not letting the cat thing out of my sight. As I neared the door, it turned back towards me. Leaving so soon? It said cocking its head way too far. We just met. 
Don't you want to know what I'm doing here? What I am? There was something weird about this creature. I was being far too candid with it. I couldn't stop myself from just blurting out the first thing that came to mind in its presence. Maybe that is why the conversation continued. I still question why I didn't just leave. Yeah, I would like to know all those things. I'm just terrified of you. Not an uncommon reaction. It said, licking a paw. How about a housewarming gift to break the ice, then? What could a cat possibly give me? I said, laughing. Gonna cough up a hairball in the shape of a heart? That's specious. It retorted. I could give you anything you want. What is it that you want? So what, you're like a genie cat? I get wishes? I said, trying to suppress the words I wanted to say. You could say that. I can see someone hurt you bad. Wouldn't you like to hurt them too? Said coyly. Let me hurt them for you. At that moment, I felt very small. I felt as though I was a mouse in the cat's gaze. Backed against the wall and waiting for it to pounce. I watched as its tail hypnotically darted left and right in anticipation. Every fiber in my being screamed out to stay silent, but my mouth betrayed me. Yes, I want him to hurt worse than me. I shouted, louder than I meant to. Then, in a panic, I wrenched open the door and ran to the bedroom. I closed and locked the door and jumped onto the bed. Why did I say that? My stomach churned with guilt at the words I said. I wasn't a vindictive person. I would never wish harm on someone else. At least, that's what I thought. Something about everything that just happened didn't sit right with me. I began to feel the sting of tears on my face and eventually fell back into sleep. The next morning, I laid there, staring at the ceiling, playing over the last night's events in my mind. Had it been a dream? No, I know it wasn't that but I couldn't make sense of what had happened. Eventually, I cautiously got out of bed and opened the bedroom door. I looked down the hallway to the bathroom and sure enough, the door was white wood again. I walked over to it and placed my ear against the wood. I stood there for quite a while listening for any indication of something in the bathroom. I eventually worked up the courage to open the door. There was nothing in there. It was exactly the same as the night before, minus one cat. I did my business and did the daily hygienic maintenance of combing my hair and brushing my teeth. After I had finished, I checked my phone. I had several people asking me for my drug dealing services, so I jumped in my car and started into town. I went through the routine of visiting several people and collecting money. It was almost a completely normal day. That wasn't until I saw my ex-girlfriend's car wrapped around a telephone pole. I almost crashed my own car in shock as I saw medical technicians rolling a body bag up to an ambulance. Part of me wanted to pull over and check on the situation, but deep in my heart I knew the outcome. That fucking cat definitely had given me a housewarming gift. Not one I would ever have wanted, though. I raced back home, in a huff, ready to throttle that disjointed nightmare of a feline. When I got home, I wrenched open the door and began shouting for the beast. I ran to the bathroom in a cold sweat and pulled open the wooden door, shouting into the white bathroom. I nearly turned the whole house upside down looking for it. Eventually, eyes filled with tears and out of breath, I collapsed onto the couch couldn't find it, and I didn't have the emotional capacity to continue looking. I tucked my knees to my chest and just anxiously rocked for hours until eventually, sleep came. I woke up sometime that night. I needed to use the restroom and I could feel a heavy gravity in the air. I knew it was there now. I walked to the door which had again become a rusted metal mess. I wrenched open the door and saw the cat-like entity on top of the windowsill again. You monster! I shouted, rushing towards it. 
a small bathroom rug slipping under my feet and causing me to fall face first into the linoleum. Tears were filling my eyes and my cheeks flushed with anger and embarrassment. Who? Me? What did I do? It said calmly. She's dead. My ex is dead. Why? You said you wanted her to hurt. There is no greater pain than the searing pain of one's own lungs filling with blood. It said. That's not what I wanted. I screamed. Oh dear. Sadly, there are no gift receipts with my offerings. Would you like me to bring her back? I could bring her back. Would that be a desirable gift? The cat cocked its head. Bring her back in a way that she only loves you. My heart sank at this. I couldn't possibly want that. I did want her alive, but I couldn't imagine controlling someone to love me. That seemed so wrong. No, I don't want any of that. I just want you out of my house. It's my house too. The cat said. And you haven't been a very good roommate to me. You haven't even fed me yet. I'm not supposed to feed you. What, because that old biddy says so? You're a drug dealer. Since when do you follow the rules? Now's not a great time to start being a goody two-shoes. I backed away and opened the door, crawling out of the room as my pulse pounded in my ears. I kicked it shut with my foot and turned to run to my room. I quickly discovered that was not an option. Before me, there were three rusted metal doors. I looked over my shoulder to see that the bathroom door had been replaced with a solid white wall. It's not going to be that easy. You accepted my gift. Now you must offer me a gift. Said the cat-like creature. It was sat in front of me and just in front of it was an unmarked tin can and a can opener. You have to feed me. I ran past it to one of the doors and tried to pull it open. I wanted nothing more to do with that beast. It wouldn't budge no matter how hard I tried. I ran over to the next one and again found it completely stuck. That's not going to work. You've been quite rude to me. You are such an ingrate. I feel I must force your hand. Feed me and I will allow you passage through one of the doors. I sank against one of the doors and pulled my knees to my chest. I started hyperventilating and crying again. I was trapped with this awful thing. I just wanted to leave and I couldn't even do that. And if I refuse? I sniffled out. What then? You'll never leave here. And eventually you will starve. Then I will eat you. In the end, you will have fed me. Either choice is fine by me, but my roommates always feed me. What's through the doors? I asked. Staring at the tin on the floor. Open the can and I will tell you. At my absolute wit's end, I crawled forward and opened the can through blurry eyes. The contents smelled terrible, but I pushed it forward towards the cat and it began eating. Through one door you will be transported back to this house, and I will have never met you. Your ex will be alive. She will still be cheating on you, and you will be alone in this house. Through another is the same thing, with the addition of me as your eternal companion. You will continue to feed me, and I will continue to grant you gifts. Through another, you will find nothing. What do you mean by nothing? I asked. Exactly what I mean. You're miserable. And even with a wish-granting cat, you still find yourself feeling unworthy of your life. Through the nothing door is absolute nothing. You will quickly be torn asunder body and soul. You will cease to be and reality will forget you. Part of you wants that door to be the one you go through. I am merely facilitating that part. I looked back at the three metal doors, all of which seemed to have grown bigger. I contemplated the options and I knew the cat was right. Part of me did want to just disappear. Which door is which? I asked. That's the fun part. Not even I know. It said in a mocking voice. It's like that experiment with the unobserved cat. You don't know which one it is until you open the door. 
So now I sit here, staring in horror at the possibility of choosing the wrong door. That cat refuses to give me any hint as to which is which. I know I am going to choose one soon, but I didn't want to do so without first leaving behind some sort of record. I don't know what future awaits me, but I wanted to leave you all with this advice. Don't feed the cat. My grandparents had a two-story home where my father and his two siblings grew up. I always hated visiting their house. Not because of my grandparents, but because that house always left me with a bad taste in my mouth. Something was off about the air in there. The way the air would hit my lungs would leave a stale, cold feeling in my chest. There was one aspect in particular that caused me to feel intense dread whenever I was in that house. That was the second floor. My grandparents both have had issues with walking ever since my dad went away for college as a young adult. As a result, everything on the second floor of their home has been left untouched ever since the day when my father and his siblings left for college. My grandparents simply could never make it back up the narrow creaky stairs to the second floor due to their mobility problems. Everything upstairs lay frozen in time. Kids' bedrooms perfectly preserved in the 60s and 70s. Wallpaper, fashion, and toys of that time. I hated it. It made me feel uneasy, and that part of the house always smelled like dank, rotting wood. Old-fashioned lunchbox tins, outdated clothes and styles, and even typewriters were some of the things that could be found upstairs. I was never interested but my cousin was. My cousin, who is the same age as me, loved to bully me at the time in our childhood. He knew how to make me angry, but also how to scare me. I was about six or seven when this happened. It was my grandfather's birthday and my cousin challenged myself and my younger brother to a game of hide and seek. He knew I hated the upstairs part of our grandparents' home which meant that I knew exactly where he would be hiding. There is something you should know about my grandfather. A long time ago, my grandfather was a very successful painter. The house was adorned with his creations, and his masterpieces hung from almost every available inch of their tacky wallpaper. My grandfather had several pieces which were lost to him because they had been placed somewhere upstairs at some point in time decades ago when he could still walk. Sometimes we would stumble upon them during our adventures upstairs. As my family was helping prepare the birthday dinner, my brother and cousin ran off to find a good place to hide. I began with the first floor, naturally. It was not long before I found my brother hiding behind a couch in the den. I felt much better knowing that if I had to go upstairs and search for my cousin, that my brother would at least be with me. Unfortunately for me, my cousin was not anywhere to be found on the first floor. We slowly made our way upstairs, the stench of mildew and old wood filling my nose. The stairs creaked under the small weights of our bodies, and I wondered to myself if one day the ceiling would cave in, and all of those perfectly preserved memories and rotted wood would come crashing down into modern day. My thoughts were interrupted by the sound of knocking coming from the upstairs hallway closet. I figured maybe my cousin slipped on something in the darkness, and he had unwittingly revealed his location to us. I crept towards the closet, and to my surprise the knocking sound continued. My cousin was smarter than this. What was he doing? I grasped the closet doorknob and turned it slowly. The vast darkness of the closet now exposed the light of day creeping in through the shutters revealed an array of strange art. Each of the coat hangers in that closet had a wood panel attached to the hook which had paintings of faces on them. Some of the faces were familiar, family or celebrities. Some were unknown to me. Something hit my feet on the floor. 
I looked down and made eye contact with one of the coat hanger face paintings. She had wild, frizzy black hair and eyes which stared right through me. It felt like she could see me, just as I was seeing her. She wore a crooked smile that felt wicked. I realized something more as I looked closer at the details. My grandfather had never painted the pupils. And there was something more. Under her head were a set of words scrawled out in red paint. It read, You are going to hell right now. I screamed, and my brother went to pick up the hanger to see what I had just witnessed. He dropped it as soon as he placed his hand over it. When he lifted his hand, we could see that the red paint was still wet. It was all over my brother's hand. This had to be my cousin's doing. My cousin, alerted by my screams, came running out of my uncle's bedroom where he had been hiding. When he looked over my shoulder and saw the dripping message under that horrible face, he began to scream and cry even louder than I had. I heard what sounded like soft rainfall, and I turned to see that my cousin had urinated himself. It. This couldn't have been him. The sound of heavy footsteps could be heard coming from the direction of my uncle's childhood bedroom at the end of the hall. They were as loud as thunder. As my screams intensified, my vision began to blur. The next thing I remember is my father consoling us in the kitchen, while my mother screamed obscenities at my grandfather. My parents to this day believe that my grandfather had some sort of senile episode, where he had modified one of his old paintings. I don't believe that. My cousin doesn't believe that. We know he couldn't even make it up the first few stairs. Sometimes I wonder what happened in those few moments where fear took over. Both my memory and vision have escaped me. Sometimes I wonder if I really did get away, or if this whole time I have been living in hell, never having made it out of my grandparents' closet. It was a cold day in late November. The clouds were dark and dreary and the sun was blotted out to a dull glowing orb on the horizon as it set. Night was falling soon as as I stood with my friend Anna on the beach we began to shiver more and more. It was getting much colder very fast. And so we agreed to head back to the parking lot and to our car. As we turned to leave I paused, something catching my eye off to my left. What I thought had been a flicker of light drew my attention to the mass of rocks that piled along the shoreline and jutted out a little ways into the ocean. Anna paused also, seeing me stop and followed my gaze to the rocks. What's up? She asked. I thought I saw something over there. A light or something. Oh, well, it's probably just some kids or something. I nodded and was about to turn to keep walking when I saw it again. This time, a definite flicker of light within the rocks. This time it lingered longer before going out. I turned to Anna, but she had seen it too. For some reason, we both felt a strange chill, but from within rather than from the cold wind around us. Something seemed very odd about that light flicking in the rocks. There were no caves over there that we knew of. We frequented this beach quite often all throughout the year, and had never known there to be any caves, or even any hollows large enough for a person or a larger animal. Come, let's go back. It's just some kids, Anna said again. Cece, come on, please. But I was transfixed. I can't explain why, but I was staring at the spot where the light had been when suddenly it came back, only this time staying lit up and shimmering as if coming from a fire source. I still felt the chill, and I felt drawn. I wanted the fire to warm me. I was so cold. I needed to get to the fire. I began moving toward the light when Anna grabbed my hand and yanked me back. I turned to stare at her as I jerked my hand away. She was saying something, but I couldn't understand her. Her voice was muffled, as if she was talking through thick glass. I called to her, but she did not seem to really hear me either. I continued walking on towards the light in the rocks, 
and I noticed Anna followed along. As we got to the rocks, we found a fairly large opening to a cave. The cave itself was pretty large, tall enough for us to easily stand, and spacious enough for a handful of people to sit around in. But there was no one, only a small crackling fire in the center of the cave. A pack sat near the fire, as well as an unrolled sleeping bag and a book of matches next to it. Anna and I looked at each other. We climbed inside. Once in the cave, all sounds of beach, the waves, the wind, the seagulls had all ceased. We could see the scenery through the mouth of the cave, but could hear nothing of it at all. Now only the crackling of the little fire. We noticed too the wonderful warmth sweeping through our freezing bodies. We sat down near the fire, warming our hands and feet and staring into the flames. I wanted to speak to her. I wanted to tell her I was sorry. For what? Anna asked. What? I said, snapping out of my daze. You were saying you were so sorry, over and over, for like the past five minutes. Oh, I... I don't know. I think I'm warm enough. Let's go back. This is weird. That's what I was trying to tell you. And aside as she got to her feet, only to stop suddenly and gasp. Cece, the cave, the entrance is gone. I looked all around. There was no hole, no ocean, no beach, only solid, smooth rock. This didn't even look like the beach rock that we had entered through. Okay, let's not panic, I said trying to stay calm. Why did you insist on coming in here? Anna yelled, clearly panicking. It was so cold out there. I wanted to warm up by the fire. But we had no idea whose fire it was, and it wasn't even that cold. I... I don't know. Let's just figure out how to get out, okay? Anna glared at me for a moment before turning her attention to the rock, feeling around for a crevice or something. I began doing the same before noticing a tangle of brush and bushes at the far side of the cave that I had not noticed before. Or maybe had not been there before. I showed Anna and we approached them. Cold air. We both felt it as we got nearer, and then we definitely felt and heard a stiff wind blowing through the bushes. I began pushing aside the branches to reveal a small opening large enough for us to fit through. But what was on the other side did not make me want to go out there. A vast and dark, snowy landscape met my eyes. Rolling hills covered in towering pines stretched as far as I could see. Anna looked through as well and gasped. We exchanged looks, glanced back at the crackling fire, and then back out to the snow. The sky was still gloomy with dark and foreboding clouds, and the wind was harsher and sharper than ever. Anna and I nodded at each other, silently agreeing to go out and figure out where we were and what was going on. Had we been drugged? Had we been abducted? Once we stepped outside, we knew our shorts and t-shirts from our beach attire were quite ill-suited for this weather. To make matters worse, it began snowing. We were now standing in the middle of an increasingly violent blizzard. We looked all about us, and turning around we found the cave entrance we had just exited from was now gone. This almost did not surprise me at this point, though Anna seemed to be having a brand new wave of anxiety washing over her. As we looked about for any sense of direction, we were seemingly shown the way by a far-off light atop one of the distant tree-covered hills. This was not a firelight, though, it seemed as it was quite bright and yellow and round and was not flickering. I motioned to Anna, and we began making our way as quickly as we could. The direction was against the wind, so in addition to the freezing snow, we were pushing against heavy, piercing winds. Our skin was already quite frozen, and I could no longer feel my feet or hands, not to mention my poor face. The faraway light now appeared to be much closer. What had seemed to be possibly close to a mile off was now only just up a steeply sloping hill, 
that we had just reached the bottom of. I began climbing haphazardly up the side, slipping and sliding with every grasp in the snow. Anna followed close behind. After what felt like an eternity flailing through the snow, we reached the top of the hill where the wind and snow had stopped almost completely. A slight breeze blew, and a single snowflake drifted serenely down here and there. And in the center of the hilltop was a small hut with only a door and a single window, from which the bright yellow light was glowing. We wasted no time getting to the door, hoping that it was at least much warmer inside than out here. I knocked hard on the door several times. We waited, shivering, nearly frozen to death, but there was no answer. Anna barged through the door. Forget it. I'm going in. I followed after her. She screamed. She was gone. I caught myself just in time, maintaining my balance at the very edge of a cliff. I looked behind me. No door. Nothing but a vast expanse of rock. I looked back down over the edge. Anna lay at the bottom, a disturbingly far fall, laying flat against the rock floor below. Blood was pooling around her head. Anna? I screamed as tears began to flood my eyes. Anna, say something. Please. Then I noticed a rope tied securely around a large boulder to my right. I didn't care if it was a trap. I had to try it. I grabbed hold of the rope and slowly climbed down to where Anna lay. I ran to her and picked her up in my arms, covering myself in blood. Her head was split, her skin already graying, her heart not beating. Anna? I sobbed, holding her close to me. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Anna! Tears spilled down my face for what seemed to be hours until I heard the clatter of rocks above me. My head snapped up and I looked to see a figure standing on the cliff high above me. The cliff seemed to have become taller, and in the lighting it seemed nothing more than a black silhouette. Help! I called desperately. Help me, please. I just stood there. Please, I need help. I don't know what's going on or where I am. Can you help me? slowly raised its arm and pointed one long finger at me. I saw where the face should have been begin to shimmer and shift and suddenly the figure was right before my eyes, wearing Anna's face, but a deeply distorted version of it. The eyes were pure black and the mouth was grotesquely wide. The scream it emitted was ear-splitting. I jumped back in shock and felt myself falling, falling deeper and deeper. And deeper, all was darkness around me. Thud. I hit something soft, cool, and sandy. I heard the calls of seagulls. I heard the crashing of waves and the sound of laughter and chatter. I opened my eyes that I seemed to have shut tightly, only to be blinded by the bright sunlight. I was on the beach again, laying on my towel in the sand. People were all around, children running and chasing one another, while parents conversed under colorful umbrellas. The sky was clear blue, not a cloud to be seen. I had just fallen asleep. It had all been a bad dream. Anna's towel was next to mine along with her bag and sandals, but I could not find her. Anna was nowhere to be seen. But what I did see was the flicker of light off to my right, in the rocks. I used to have a prideful disbelief in the supernatural. I was determined everything could be explained with science, because I was young. I'd recently gotten my first telescope, and I didn't yet know of the vast inadequacies of human scientific knowledge. Sometimes I think that's just how it works. The supernatural world chooses to reveal itself to disbelievers because the crush of pride is greater. At the time this all happened, I was only nine. I was determined that I was mature for my age and nothing could scare me. I was 
very wrong. My grandmother arrived back home from a cruise with presents. For me, she'd brought a porcelain doll. It stood about three feet tall, almost as tall as me at the time. It had blue eyes, curly blonde hair, a frilly purple dress, and a hat to match. The head and arms of the doll were the only real glass components. The torso was stuffed and the base of the doll was an open umbrella which served to fluff out the dress. The umbrella detail is important later. I love the doll. I played with it all the time. Gently so as not to break it. And for a while, everything was fine. I had a few instances I can remember of finding things out of place. An antique hairbrush from my great-grandmother found on the floor. My Game Boy in the sock drawer. And a few things just went missing. I blamed it on my younger sister and angrily insisted she stop touching my things. Then the doll started to move. All the time, I'd come in my room and she was in a different spot from the special place I'd picked for her, across from my bed. I was sure my sister was trying to annoy me because she knew the doll was important to me. After a few months, my birthday arrived. I had three friends over to stay the night. The sun had gone down and the four of us were playing games in the floor of my room. I turned to one of my friends to tell her it was her turn, but she was staring intently past me. After failing to get her attention, I turned to see what she was looking at. The doll. I think I just saw her eyes move, she said. The other two of my friends turned simultaneously to look at the doll as well. The instant our eyes were all on the doll, bang. The lights went out. A massive lightning bolt struck from a storm that seemed to have come from nowhere. We all ran, screaming, down the stairs as fast as we could, tripping over each other and half falling our way down. At the base of the stairs, we saw light and realized that the power had only gone out in my room. My mom blamed my overactive imagination and those crazy cartoons. I was always watching. So unfortunately for the time being, I was stuck with the doll. I realized all my things moving and the doll moving hadn't been my sister after all. At this point, I was very scared of the doll. I had a closet that had an incorrectly installed lock on it. It locked from the outside, so I decided I'd put the doll in there and lock her in at night. Confidently woke up the next morning feeling safe again, and opened my eyes to find the doll, back in her spot and the closet door wide open. What was I to do? The doll can move and unlock doors without a key. My mom doesn't believe me about it, and I can't get rid of the lovely present my grandmother got me. I thought, I'll break it maybe, but I don't know how the supernatural world works. What if some spirit in the doll gets unlocked when I break it? What if it kills me? Feeling defeated, I finally devised a less than perfect plan. I spent less time in my room, trying to only be in there when my mom was also present. I'd watch TV as my mom went to sleep. I set a sleep timer on the TV, and when I was sure my mom was asleep, I'd race downstairs to sleep on the couch. For whatever reason, the doll did seem confined to my room. For a while, my plan worked. But one fateful night, I accidentally fell asleep before making it downstairs. In the middle of the night, I awoke suddenly to a strange swish sound. Half asleep, I slowly put the pieces together. The sound of an umbrella scooting across carpet. I shot open my eyes and there beside my bed was the doll with arms outstretched towards my neck. I squealed and dove under my covers. It's dark. All I hear is my heavy breathing and the pound of my pulse. After what felt like hours, I gathered the courage to peek out from under the blankets again. The doll was back in her spot, across the room, staring directly at me. I sprinted out from the covers and down the stairs to safety. After that, I bugged my mom incessantly to let me get rid of the doll. She eventually gave in and she dropped it off at a goodwill. A sigh of relief. Thought it was all over. Usually people don't believe me when I tell this story, even up to this point, 
But the real kicker of all of this is that the house burned down, totaled. We lost everything. The fire department was never able to determine the cause of the fire, and I'm ever so lucky our plans changed at the last minute that day. So we weren't at home when we should have been. There's a few areas in the Los Padres forest that are public lands known as BLM, Bureau of Land Management. You can hunt and camp on those lands with far less restrictions than national parks or private lands. Every now and again I like to head out there with a 22 rifle and hunt for small game that are in season. In most cases, you can't hunt from or across a trail, so some of my spots are a ways off the beaten path. A good chunk of the Los Padres has more in common with a desert than what you think of when you think of a forest. There's a lot of waste and shoulder-high dry climate shrubs. So I'll typically find a spot a little elevated to set up camp. I'll survey an area that's densely populated with rabbit, and if I'm lucky I'll get one on the first day to have at dinner, and a few the next day for the freezer. Rabbit, hard delicious, and something about cooking a freshly caught camp dinner is deeply satisfying. Since the bag limit allows for a certain amount per day, after I pack up camp I'll try to get a few on the way out that I'll process at my truck where a cooler with ice packs is waiting. There have been multiple trips where I've gone out without seeing a single person. Most of the time it's either a game warden that wants to make sure I'm not fucking up, Sometimes it's a hunter, and we'd share where we'd be generally for safety reasons. The area I hunt isn't exactly a hidden gem, so if someone is hunting for something, I'm not. I don't mind giving some tips or sightings. Occasionally you'd get a hiker or backpire that I'd wave to. I just claimed a rabbit. I gutted it for the scavengers. I clean the rest at camp and cook it on my little camp stove with some tortillas and taco fixings. I was halfway back when I saw three backpackers heading my way. I double checked my safety and slung my rifle to appear less intimidating. It looked like we'd crossed paths. I remember that the first thing I noticed when they were close enough to make out details was that they were a little underdressed. It was a warm day, but the Los Padres gets pretty cold at night that time of year, and when you're this far in the middle of nowhere, people are usually decorated in REI, or Cabela's gear. They had backpacking packs on, but their clothes were street clothes. There were two men and one woman. One man was wearing Converse high tops. I remember because I thought of how miserable the two miles it took to get to where they were must have been. I waved and said hello. They were very friendly at first. We talked about how deep they were going in. I asked if the guy's feet were okay. He griped about it, and we left. They asked me how I expected to get a deer out of here. I told him that I was hunting rabbit, and that I'd already bagged one today. Their whole demeanor changed. The taller man hijacked the conversation. His tone was frustrated, and he began rifling off questions about why I'd hunt rabbits. He'd been quiet the entire conversation before. My explanations were only making him more angry. He asked me, how would you like it if someone was out here hunting you? As he said this, he took a step forward and put his hand on a knife that was in a leather sheath on his belt. Maybe he did it subconsciously. I didn't know, and didn't care. I took a step back and unsung my rifle, keeping the barrel pointed at the dirt but angled in his direction. The, the other two immediately told me to calm down. I highlighted that their friend had a hand on his knife. None of them heard me click off the safety. They looked at him and he took his hand off it like a kid caught with his finger in the cake. I told him that I was sorry that the conversation soured, but it was over. I gave them a wide berth on the trail and we went on our way, both of us glancing over our shoulder as we hiked. Luckily, I always tuck my camp somewhere cozy, and I didn't imagine they'd be able to see where I was going. I was still a little shaken up, but 
when I arrived at camp, the sun was going to be down soon, and I was very hungry. I grilled up some green onions and jalapenos with my freshly cleaned rabbit and some olive oil. I snacked on my tacos happily and prepped my gear for the morning's hunt. I was having trouble sleeping. I'd already killed my lights for the night, but I think the adrenaline dump from earlier had me a little jittery. I always have some room or weight for my Nintendo, but I'm having trouble sleeping. A quick game will usually calm me enough to nod off. Being alone in the woods, in the middle of nowhere, really bugs me until right before bed. I was in the middle of a Mario level when I heard footsteps. We get Black Bear, but they're harmless unless you piss off a mom or find a desperate young male. I was worried about a mountain lion. If one wants you, you're kind of fucked. They're active at night. There was a small window of time where you could legally purchase magazines greater than 10 rounds in California. Whenever I was this deep in the middle of nowhere, I'd keep a 25 round magazine for my Ruger loaded with 40 grain hollow points. I know a 22 isn't much against a black bear or mountain lion, but I was glad to have it. Maybe I'd get lucky. It was a while, but I heard more footsteps again. It's dry out here and there's so much crunchy stuff to step on. But as the footsteps grew nearer, it hit me. It wasn't one set of footsteps. It was two. Maybe three. I was relieved for a moment. It must be lost. I set my rifle down and started to unzip my tent. That's when I heard it. A man's voice saying, I think he's over this way. In a tone just above a whisper. They were close. This worried me. Why would they be whispering? I grabbed my light and my rifle and stood just outside my tent. Hello? Are you okay? I yelled, but the footsteps stopped and everything was quiet. It was maybe a minute before I spoke up again. Are you lost? Do you need help? I yelled again. Still no answer. And they were close enough for me to hear them. They didn't want my help or to be seen. I started shining the light around my camp. It's strong and I had it set to its highest setting. If someone is out there, show yourself. I yelled. Still nothing. I was terrified. Everything was still. I broke the silence with a warning shot at a high angle in the direction that I thought I heard the voice come from. The three bodies bolted away through the brush. The direction they ran off in was dense, so I never actually saw them. I aimed my weapon and light in that direction, but I was already questioning the legality of the warning shot. Shooting someone in the back was a slimy way to go to prison. In the distance, I heard, You're going to die out here. I cranked another shot in the air, almost straight up. Fuck you. I yelled back. I began to gather my things. As soon as I felt like they were far enough away, I taped my strong light to the end of my rifle and packed up my tent. Once I was ready, I didn't want to wait until sunup. They didn't appear to be using lights, and they ran straight through dense, thorny bushes. They would have had to take time to address that. Plus, I was confident that I could find the riverbed with my light and the riverbed led back to the dirt road where I was parked. I would pan my light around every few hundred yards to make sure I wasn't being followed. As I walked, I thought about it. How were they moving without lights? Why were they sneaking up on my camp in the dead of night? What were they doing out here in the first place? His last words were echoing in my head. Was I going to die out here? Over some rabbits. It was slow going in the dark, but after a few hours of slowly traversing through the riverbed by flashlight, making sure not to miss the opening that led back to the road. If they were on this much of a mission to get me, I expected that maybe my truck was trashed. But no, like a glorious bastion of hope, my truck was there and untouched. It would still be miles before I reached cell reception, but when I did, I called 911 and I gave them the coordinates of where I was when I made camp. 
My wife was reluctant to let me go hunting again for a bit, but now I always go with a friend or two. You really should always do this. But hunting used to be my me time. What bothers me is wondering what their endgame was. Were they trying to trash my camp? Were they hoping to catch me sleeping? Did they really want to kill me? Also, how were they able to move so fast through Thornbush and Yucca? How could they move at all without tripping over themselves in the dark? Was it even the same people? Thought it was three, but it could have been two or even one. I was scared, and like I said, I never saw anyone. Not at night. I just saw the bushes move and heard someone tell me that I was going to die. I told this story to a friend and they said something that bothers the fuck out of me. If you never saw a person, how can you be sure it was human? We laughed about it, but I never saw the person that was creeping on my camp. The voice didn't match the sound like the two men I'd spoken to, but I'd never heard them in an angry tone. If it wasn't them, who was it? I still have nightmares about that day. My light shining on countryside frantically on a moonless night, having heard the voices of men searching for me, hearing one of them call for my death miles away from help. That night hike back to the truck was one of the scariest things I've ever had to do. To give some context onto why I was inside the home, I am an estimator for a flooring company. I come into homes, take measurements of the home, and give a list of supplies to the installers to bring from the warehouse to the job site to finish the job. I texted the homeowner the previous night the, uh, what time frame I would be there. Usually a two hour window for myself to get there and complete my job. He told me no one would be there and gave me the garage code which is a pretty usual ordeal for me. Nothing out of the ordinary. I pull into the driveway, noticing in my mind that this home was built in the 70s and had a clear, visible attic window from above. I step inside the home from the garage and it is almost completely empty. No one there. Just like the customer said, he asked that I measure for everything that has carpet, so everything on the main floor, basement stairs and the entire upstairs apart from a bathroom, and the master bath vanity area, which he mentioned in his text. Still, nothing unusual. I step into the living room, which has an ugly red carpet, an old chandelier, and, oddly, a stepladder tossed on the floor, and what appeared to be broken shards of glass from a fluorescent light bulb. I thought it was odd, but... Ultimately, I thought, since it was an empty home, clearly the customer was moving in or out, and some renovations were being done. No red flags were ringing in my head until I stepped into the adjacent room, which was an entry to the front door, which I checked to see if the closet was carpeted in. When I opened the door to peek inside and stuck my head in, I heard something that did give me the chills. I heard very clear footsteps directly above me. There was no mistaking it. One foot dragging in front of the other. I heard the floorboards overhead creaking underneath each footstep, but I ultimately rationalized this in my head to be just old house noises. I explored the house for a bit to find the basement stairs that he mentioned. I walked directly down the entryway to the end of the hall where it split off. To the left, the living room, to the right, the kitchen, and directly to my right were in fact the basement stairs by the kitchen. It was dark as shit down there, and I couldn't see the end, but I could see there was a light switch towards the bottom. I walked slowly down the steps. Each step the floorboards creaked like I have never heard before. When I reached the light switch to flip it on, I saw just enough of the basement to step down onto the concrete and take a look at the stairs. At the bottom of the step, maybe three feet in front of me, there was a large cemented wall, with no padding or insulation that you would typically see in basements like these. To the left, 
a storage area to the right, the rest of the basement. When I turned around to face the stairs, which were a straight shot down, I could see in my peripheral vision the rest of the open basement. Now to my left illuminated by a window, all I could really see was a small radius of light surrounding the window, the rest obscured by shadows, and I could just barely make out where the walls were. As I was typing down info of the stairs, I noticed I heard what was clearly shoes moving across the concrete, very quietly, along with a few no sniffles, as if this person or thing was trying to hide from me, but not doing a very good job. I got down the measurements of the stairs as quickly as I could and ran back up the stairs and shut the door behind me. Now all I had was the upstairs. As I was mentally preparing myself to go up the stairs, the movement upstairs was really consistent. Maybe every five seconds at most, I'd hear someone or something shuffle around. By now, I was in full paranoia mode, but I still mustered up the courage to go up the steps and get the job done. From the hall, I could tell there were three bedrooms with closets and the master bedroom, with one bathroom in the hall and one in the master. In the hall, I could hear either someone on the same level as I was standing or above me moving around just as constantly as before. I could also hear the bathtub in the bathroom to my left dripping, but wasn't brave enough to check it. I was still dead set on getting the job done and getting the fuck out of there. I decided to start with the master. If you walk into the room, there was the vanity doorway to my right and the closet to the left and a big walk-in closet on the same wall. As I was drawing up the room, my hands were shaking so bad, I couldn't draw the lines straight. The footsteps directly above me were stressing me out and giving me anxiety. I don't know why I didn't decide to bolt the hell out of there. I didn't even have the courage to tell this person in hopes that they didn't know I was here. I wasn't even fully sure I was alone. As I was measuring the door, I made sure I saw nothing in the vanity area and everything was turned off. Nothing suspicious. Still the movement above me. I got the hallway and two of the bedrooms done fairly quickly. All without a problem, but still, the constant movement was above me. It did not stop the whole time. As I was approaching the third bedroom, and the last thing I needed before I could finally leave, I was so afraid for my life. I saw through the doorway the attic access was in this room. I did not know if something would be in here or not. I did a search of the room and nothing. Nothing was there. I felt a relief and just measured the room and was happy to be finally able to leave. One last thing just had to happen before I left. I heard the shower nozzles turning in the master bedroom with water rushing through the pipes and subsequently the water flowing out of the shower head. I froze in terror right in my place in the hallway. After a few moments, I don't know why I didn't just run the fuck away, but I worked my way slowly back to the master bath. I braced myself at the door, ready to see anything. I quickly rushed in and to my surprise, nothing but the running water. No one was here. I didn't hear or see anyone leave here. Where I was from the master bed, I would have heard or seen someone blot away. I turned off the shower and as I was, I heard the same noise as I did in the hall as them turning on. After I turned it off, I ran out of the house through the garage. Didn't even wait for it to open or close to run to my car. And I watched as the garage door closed and I drove a couple blocks down to just sit in my car, far away to take a breather and recollect my bearings. I'm not an expert storyteller or a writer. I know that this story isn't as crazy as the others on this subreddit. I still have no answers for what happened that day, and that with how subtle the experience was, is what frightens me. I was a skeptic of ghosts until that day, and I haven't told anyone about it. Not anyone at work, the customer, or my family.
Loving your child unconditionally seems simple, but things change. Everyone has flaws, and to accept it is to love, but it can be a slippery slope. If you're too quick to forgive, behavior that seemed unreasonable quickly becomes routine. Over time, you may sacrifice more and more of your own values until all you have is unrequited love. It started when Tommy was 10 years old. I found small animal corpses in the backyard. She blamed the cat. I told her I believed her, even though I didn't. Cats don't have the dexterity to arrange little bones and entrails to tree stumps. Then there were the candles. Tommy was 12. She started bringing home armfuls of them after school. She said her room smelled bad. Inquiring further was pointless. She would have lied anyway. Most nights, the soft flicker of the candlelight was visible through the gap under her bedroom door. I could hear her muttering inside from the hallway. It was indecipherable, like another language. Didn't even sound like Tommy. Once, I crept to the door and put my ear against it to listen. The muttering stopped and the door was like ice against the side of my face. A pit formed in my stomach and I felt the urge to vomit. Dizzy? I stepped away and the muttering began again. Tommy was 14 when she started high school. The girls in her grade made it hard for her. They picked on her plain dark clothes and her unstyled hair. Tommy never acted upset or bothered by her poor treatment. When I suggested we go to a therapist, she laughed and shook her head. I'll take care of it, she said. Don't worry about me. The parent in me was angry. How could I not worry? She was my little girl. Or she was supposed to be anyway. Every day she seemed less and less my daughter and more my strange roommate. Later that year, things hit a tipping point. Inside of one week, the girl that tormented Tommy at school all became victims of bizarre injuries or worse. One girl was found in the woods behind the school. She was alive, but barely. Bones in her arms and legs were missing. No blood, no incisions. The day after, another girl spontaneously lost her sight and hearing. It happened during her first driving lesson. The girl's mother didn't survive the accident. A third child went missing and wasn't found for a month. They discovered her in an abandoned barn about a hour away from her home. She wasn't recognized as human. Her bone structure had shifted and changed. She moved on all fours with ease and developed hard calluses that resembled hooves on her palms and feet. The girl could no longer speak. She only screamed in half girl and half ungulate squeals. Another parent described it to me in great detail. I hung up the phone without saying goodbye and I puked on the kitchen floor. When I informed Tommy of her classmate, she giggled. Tommy, my baby who never smiled, fucking giggled, as I described the most disturbing news I'd ever heard. That was my breaking point. That night, I approached her door during the candlelit chanting. Breathing in sharply, I summoned my courage and swung open the door. And there she was in all her horrible beauty. The thing in front of me looked nothing like Tommy, but the aura I felt was hers. Tommy sat on a blood-soaked throne made of various contorted body parts from numerous creatures. She was like nothing from any world I knew. Skinless and eyeless. With pulsing red muscles and veins. Her long bony fingers rested over the arm of the throne. And ended in bird-like talons that clicked against the chair's bony composition. She had no real face. But an endless number of teeth in her massive maw. The teeth didn't match and looked as if they could belong to the creatures that compromised the chair. Atop her spiny shoulders, there was the vague shape of a human head that peaked in a crown-like crest made of bone. She stood and I thought her shape would never stop rising. Towering at several feet taller than my six-foot frame, I felt my knees go weak. And I fell. With each step she took toward me, blood and viscera dripped to the ground. 
the terrifying thing cocked its head to the side and did not move its maw to speak. But Tommy's voice materialized in my head. Remember your purpose. What you feel is fleeting. A veneer. Leave. Remember. I suddenly found myself on our living room. I did as Tommy asked, and I remembered. Where was my wife? When was Tommy born? What was her favorite food? And where are the pictures of us? The answers to the questions didn't exist. None of it mattered. All a lie engraved into my mind to conceal the truth. I recalled my purpose. To serve her and protect us from the outside world. I forgot from time to time. But the confusion is necessary to reduce suspicion. Tommy allowed me to write this so I can read it when I start to slip again. I'll do anything to guard her, even if it means I lose myself sometimes. Unconditional love is complicated like that. As a state trooper in the cold darkness of Alaska, sometimes I have to go on what we grimly call popsicle patrol. It's a common myth that alcohol makes you warmer. In reality, it just makes you feel warmer but doesn't prevent you from slowly freezing to death. Sometimes folks too drunk to drive home from the bar will end up walking home completely unaware of the effects of the elements. One night I came across an old man frozen blue and laying on the sidewalk. Disturbing as that might be, it's not the eeriest thing I've come across while on patrol in this frozen landscape. That prize goes to what I experienced just a month ago that still has me up at night. There I was in the barren darkness, driving my usual route along the icy roads and checking for drunkards along the thick snow-covered environment. It was especially difficult to see since there was a bit of snowstorm that night. I didn't really expect many people out wandering in this weather. I was just about to head back when I suddenly saw a woman in a large coat walking alone along the side of the road. The snow was coming down in a blinding flurry, and the temperature was much too cold to be walking even with a winter coat. I immediately pulled my vehicle over to check on her. When I opened my car door and stepped out into the snow, a harsh gust of wind hit me. It was then that I heard it. The haunting, faraway sound of a flute playing was being carried by the arctic winds. I approached the woman who was still walking forward away from my vehicle. Miss, are you alright? I called out to her, but she didn't turn around or respond. I ran to catch up with her, again asking if she was okay. But she just kept walking. I stood in her path to block her, but she just diverted her course slightly to the left and went around me like a faulty roadblock. It was then that I first got a good look at her face, glimpsed only through the falling snow. She was incredibly pale from the cold. Her lips were very badly chapped and had turned a shade of bluish purple. It looked as if at any moment she could pass out or succumb to the weather, though, like a zombie, she marched onward. Three more people then emerged from the blinding storm. A man and two women. They too were walking in the direction of the strange woman. I watched as they fell in line behind her like ducklings in a row. I heard the flute sound again, but louder this time, and a chill went down my spine. Suddenly the snow stopped falling completely and my visibility cleared. I saw that more people had now joined this odd parade, this time two men and three women. One of the men was a very elderly man, the rest seemed to range in age from about mid-twenties to early forties. They all wore only a single layer of winter clothing. They looked like any normal people you'd see in a crowd. The only thing off about them was their bizarre, delirious behavior. I put my hand on the shoulder of the guy at the back of the line. Sir, I said forcefully, what's going on? He managed to break free from me and followed the group. I watched in amazement and horror 
As yet more people emerged from the seemingly empty black night and began following this peculiar line of people walking along the side of the road in the snow. With all of them ignoring my verbal commands, I half-heartedly attempted to handcuff one of them, but they resisted mightily, shaking me off and continuing to move forward like a machine. Nothing stopped the endless march forward. I didn't want to be aggressive or hurt any of these people. I was trying to help them and look out for their safety, but they remained zombified and unconcerned for their own well-being. Looking back, I wish I had tackled them to the ground or done more to stop their reckless parade. In the moment, however, I didn't, and that haunts me. At that moment, there were five men and seven women strolling aimlessly in a row through the snow. At a complete loss for what I should do, I phoned for backup. I'm not sure what the heck is going on, but I've got like a dozen people here in real danger of freezing to death. They're not complying and I need backup, I said over the radio. I watched as the group veered off onto the icy road. The situation was definitely becoming more dangerous. Now the distant flute playing sounded close, and I could hear it clearly and continuously. Suddenly they each stopped and began to strip off their winter clothes. When they were all standing stark naked, they began to march once more off in the direction of the woods, their bare feet stepping across the ice-covered pavement. I stood bewildered by the deranged display with a hollow feeling in the pit of my stomach. They walked directly into the pathway of any potential oncoming traffic as they made their way towards the tree line of the wilderness. Only then did I see where the people were heading and where the sound was coming from. The procession of freezing ghouls moved across the slippery road and to the dark snowy woods just beyond it. There within the dark woods stood a small grotesque creature that I can only describe as an elf. In its hands it held a carved wooden flute. It looked like something straight out of an old folklore story or fairy tale. Around the being was an aura of purple light. All I could do was stare at this cartoonish abomination as it played its entrancing music. The creature, noticing that I'd seen it, cocked its head to the side like a dog and looked at me with a mischievous expression. I lifted my weapon. It had dark, hypnotic eyes like looking down a deep well. The elf-like being remained unmoved, its lips still pressed on the wooden flute. In that moment, I no longer felt like a police officer aiming a firearm, but like a small child pretending with a plastic toy gun. It was like I had been taken back to my childhood. The disturbing form began to perform a mocking dance, grinning eerily as it played on. For some odd reason, I was physically unable to squeeze the trigger. The signals from my brain just wouldn't move my hand. Suddenly, a... Blindingly bright flash of light came from the wilderness and I dropped my handgun. I watched as the line of people disappeared into the woods, and no matter how much I yelled or protested, they faded from sight into the strange purple glow, consumed forever into the light. The elf offered only a small chuckle before running off into the woods. When backup arrived, I didn't know what to tell them. There was no trace of any of these people ever being there, so I made up a lie. I said the pale group of people out there walking had phoned for a friend of theirs to give them a ride home, and that I saw them safely drive away. If only things were so simple. Consider this the police report I should have written that night. Before my wife passed, we had decided we'd have a big family, one we could love and cherish and always be there for. At the time, we hadn't realized the gravity of our decision and how much it would change our lives. But to this day, I have no regrets. We couldn't conceive naturally, so we had adopted. The thing about having children, whether of biological relation or not, is that you have no idea who you'll get. Sure, with blood you can determine what percentage of your genetics will be passed down, 
and can likely assume race, eye color, hair color, etc. about the child based on you and your partner. But that child's personality and everything about them is unique to them. Yet my wife had looked at her kids and just knew. She knew all of her daughters, knew her son, and had insisted on adopting every single one of them. She knew exactly who she was taking home, and she cherished them so, so deeply. This is why it hadn't been surprising to hear that her spirit had remained to watch over us. Or, at least, that was what we had originally thought. For introduction, I would like to tell you about my children. My wife and I have five beautiful kids. The eldest was Anita, who was 17 at the time. Following her were the twins, Delaney and Daria, at 15. Our youngest was 9, and her name was Lydia. And at 12, my only son was Kazuke. Because half of my children were born of different cultures, speaking different languages than I, I had made sure I was able to speak with them both in their native tongue as well as in English. My wife and I had learned Mandarin Chinese for Anita and Japanese for Kisuke. Though they rarely spoke their languages at the time, I kept up with grammar and practice just in case. Which is why, at first, it had shocked me when Kisuke had come to me and said, Yuri Ga Aru, there is a ghost. At the time we had recently moved, my wife had been killed in the city, accidentally shot in a drive-by while walking to the parking garage after work. I hadn't wanted our children to remain there, to remain in the home that she had stayed in and to live in the very city she had been murdered in. So I took us to my hometown in the middle of the rural Midwest. Real estate is far cheaper here, and my job is quite versatile, so it had been relatively easy to make happen. Only a week into living in the new house had Kizuke inform me of the ghost. I looked at him and had asked, Doko Ka, where? Asoko, he had said, pointing upstairs, over there. Dare? I had asked, who? And Keisuke had said, Mom. It hadn't been abnormal for Keisuke to get lost in the grief. My children all mourned in their own ways, of course, and my son had often taken to talking about my wife as if she were still with us, right next to us, whether at the dinner table, or in the car, or out and about. He had acted as if his mother was alive. I had entertained him at the time. Well, I had switched over to English. I'm sure she just wants to say hi to you. Kasuke had stuck to Japanese. Nihongo o Hanasanai. That had sent a chill to fear down my spine for some reason. Hearing my 12 year old monotonously say she can't speak Japanese made me nervous. Because if my son were talking to her ghost, why hadn't she been able to understand the language she had taken years to learn just for him? It was then that I had realized what my son was getting at, so I had told him, Janai, that's not mom. Kasuke had nodded. Now, I believe in ghosts. As a child, I had experienced my fair share of oddities. And during my college years, I had been a self-proclaimed amateur investigator of the paranormal. While I had never seen anything, even to this very day, I had witnessed lights turning on or off, heard footsteps and voices, and had once gotten touched despite nobody being behind me. Who was I to say that my son wasn't seeing his mother, or rather, someone who looked like his mother? Months had passed. Keisuke had told me, always in Japanese, about the woman upstairs that looked like mom, acted like mom, sounded like mom, but wasn't able to speak Japanese or Mandarin Chinese. He had told me that she was kind, that she was watching over us, 
that she saw everything we did, yet that hadn't been a comfort. Not at all. It was sometime in late July, soon before the new school year, when I had woken to Keisuke screaming. My son often had nightmares. Even now, in his 30s, the kid has an active imagination that sometimes gets the better of him. And so I had assumed, mid-run into his room, that it had been just that. A nightmare. That was all. A nightmare wouldn't tug on a child's leg, though. Leg, blanket, and even the mattress, all jerking downwards at once, as if something had a hold on his ankle and was trying to drag him away. Kasuke had grabbed at the sheets and... I had grabbed him, yanking him up and into my arms without thought. There had been no resistance when I had done so, I remember thinking, while crossing his room and walking into the hall, that whatever had been pulling him would trip us on our way. But nothing had. I carried Keisuke, a sobbing, shaking mess into my room, telling his sisters to go back to bed, that everything's fine go to bed. I don't think either of us got any more sleep that night. It had happened again about a week later, and again I don't recall to what frequency, but just that, for months, we had both lost so much sleep to the fear of it happening. I had switched his room with mine, had him sleeping downstairs rather than up, and moved him and Anita into the same room, and still it happened. Only when he was alone, though. What does she want? I asked him one day, while we were out at the grocery store. He had made some sort of vague gesture and said something along the lines of, Not sure. Have you told her to stop? I asked. Keisuke assured me. I told them to, but they won't. They, implying more than one. When I had inquired about that, Kasuke had told me that there were multiple not-moms. They would stand around his bed, one or multiple pulling, several watching. When I had finally asked, how many are there, Kasuke had gotten quiet. He hadn't looked at me in the eye, was silent the whole drive back. Only when we had pulled into the driveway did he say, at first there was just one. Now, there's nine. He had been staring at the house, not moving, not unbuckling his belt. So I asked, safely in Japanese, Kaiga Shitait, have you been hurt? I, no. It didn't matter. The look in his eyes told me we had to leave. Those not moms must have known, though. Because as soon as I had begun looking for new, affordable places, things got so much worse, so much faster. Anita had seen him get tugged in their shared room, both during the day and at night. His sisters had told me about when they were home alone, he would jerk backwards or stumble as if something had grabbed his shoulder or had tripped him. And I had witnessed things being thrown his way, clothes, toys, books, dishware. I had even caught a heavy can of paint before it could crack open on his head. It had been up on a shelf, completely void of the ledge. Things would always fall. Items of his would go missing. And every goddamn night, they would grab for him. The one time the not moms had been successful was the last time we had been in the house. Keisuke had taken to sleeping in my room. We had gone to extreme measures, chaining him to the headboard, loosely. Not enough to cut circulation or keep his wrist above his head, but merely to keep him from being dragged too far. Tying the blankets down at the end, and it had seemed to work. The blankets would pull, his feet would jerk, and he would go nowhere. I underestimated the knot, moms. They learned how to unlock the strap around his wrist. I had woken up to his shrieking. An invisible force yanked him sideways, foregoing his legs and pulling him head first to the floor. It was the farthest these things had gotten him, and they didn't relent. 
I scrambled out of bed and grabbed him just before he could be dragged out into the hallway. With my feet planted on either side of the doorway, I had hugged him close and prayed it would release him. We heard the footsteps only a second later. Fast. Far too fast to be human. Skittering across the hallway rug, against the drywall on the ceiling. A disembodied, high-pitched chortle followed. When Anita had thrown open her door, all the way at the end of the hall, something had slammed it shut in her face. She had only just managed to avoid getting her fingers smashed. The twins had been crying in their room, yelling out, What was that? And it's in here, and go away through their sobs. I had curled over Kasuke, but something still fought me as I felt a lung-crushing pressure against my back. And something had been trying to force my chin up and away from where it had been tucked against the crown of my son's head. Luckily, Lydia had been untouched and perfectly fine. Kasuke's head had been bleeding. To this day, he has a scar from where his forehead had clipped against the edge of the bed frame. A short, thick rope of scar tissue against his hairline. When I had gotten to my feet, I had made sure to drag Kesuke upright with me. He had been shaking and silent, likely scared shitless, and I just couldn't do it anymore. We had packed bags for a few days in a hotel and left only an hour later. I had stayed with Kesuke the entire time. It took me mere days to find an apartment and negotiate moving in. The damn thing had been cramped and all my kids had to share a room while I shoved our stuff into storage but we had made it work until I could afford a different place. I also got a friend of mine, a very spiritual woman to get her friend to put protection on him. She told me that my late wife had been protecting him all along, but now he was vulnerable. I hope that protection is still sturdy in place. Even though it's been about two decades, Kesuke tells me he remembers it clear as day. Only a few months ago when we had all gathered to celebrate 4th of July together. He had told me. Oh yeah, I remember that. Anita had shared with us her experience of sleeping in the same room as Kasuke. She had told us that she had seen something sometimes. At first she thought it was her imagination since it had always been in the middle of the night when she had woken mid-dream. But when she had described it, Kasuke had shot up and agreed. According to them, it had looked like their mother head on. It had her long black hair, her round face, her smile. But Anita had said that when it wasn't looking at her, it had bulging eyes, as if they had been just stuck right on top of another pair. So she says. And its face was caved in without a nose, as if it had been cleaved down the middle. Forgive the possible graphic image. Anita is a horror poet. It was only then, a few months ago, on the 4th of July, that I remembered how Keisuke's mother had died. The woman who had him in her custody when he was only a toddler had been solemn as she's son. The poor girl shot herself. She didn't die right away, though. She just put the gun under her chin and pulled the trigger. Apparently. Keisuke's mother had been British, if I recall correctly. A British woman who had married a Japanese man, but that's all I know. I won't be telling my son this. After all, he doesn't need to know that the woman who had given birth to him was wearing his mother's face over her mutilated one, just to haunt him. The thought that her caved in, horrifying face could always be lurking right over his shoulder is terrifying to me. Apparently both Anita and Keisuke have gone back to that house, abandoned since we had left, unfortunately, and have said that they had experiences. And when I had asked Keisuke recently about anything supernatural happening, he had said, well, no weirder than anything before. May 27th, 2009. There's been a drilling in my head lately. And it's the strangest thing. 
I've come to enjoy it. It reminds me I'm still alive, still moving, still going after this year. That's an accomplishment. We finally sold the old apartment. I never thought I'd really be able to say goodbye, but here we are. Well, here I am. I guess sometimes life doesn't wait to ask if you're ready. The universe is in a constant state of flux, and you and I are no different. I can't complain, though, really. Joey landed the job he was hoping for down here, and I've got my online store. Our new life isn't just a faraway dream anymore. It's here. It's the present. I should be feeling better. The new leaf. It's what I always wanted. Yet I woke up this morning, this perfect morning, found myself alone and started writing. Joe is probably out shopping. He'll be home in an hour or so. When he is, I'll greet him with a smile and keep up the facade. Not for him, but for me. We should be happy. We are happy. I should be happy. It took me so long to really believe I can be okay. Now that I'm here, it all feels so unnatural. I think I know why. I still haven't told him. How could I? Why would I? I've spent the past six years burying it, smothering it, hoping one day I would peek inside my mind's closet and it wouldn't be there anymore. He wouldn't be there anymore. Staring, but not at me. Staring through me. I'll never forget the look on his face. I try to remember how lucky I am. How lucky I am to be haunted by him. Haunted is a hell of a lot better than dead. Or whatever it is he had in store for me. Screw it. I won. I win and you lose, asshole. Try as I might, I can't stop it from pouring out of me. It's like the harder I try to forget, the more terrible details emerge from my repressed subconscious. Constant, gnawing, grating. Those moments and experiences are screaming, aching for me to bring them to life again. And this is the best way I know how. Pen to paper. I still don't know what made me do it. Check the basement that night. A random Tuesday in October. Still early enough in the month when there's a slight tinge of warm summer air mixed in with the autumn atmosphere. Joe wasn't in the picture yet. That would happen six months later. So I was home alone at my parents' place. Another lonely night. Not all that unusual. I was used to spending most nights alone at that point in my life. It was early. I remember glancing at the clock not long before I walked downstairs. It read 8.39. Not exactly bedtime. I didn't feel scared, or like someone was watching me. The hairs on the back of my legs didn't stand up, and I didn't have a dog to give me a heads up. I didn't walk downstairs that night because I had some magical premonition or feeling that something was wrong. I was just wandering around my house, like, as I imagine everyone does. I walked down the stairs to our basement and was immediately greeted by familiar sights. A pool table I had never really learned to use despite my dad's best efforts. An old couch, a dusty television, shelves full of absolutely worthless DVDs, even back then. Old memories came rushing back. High school afternoons spent gossiping on the couch, or depressing Friday nights wasted killing time by watching TV. So many hours, so much time. What did it all amount to? Sorry, Dan. Your little girl wasted all your time, love, and money. Why did she have to go and get killed like that? I spent so much time thinking about if I hadn't seen him. If I had carried on that night like everything was fine. My funeral, the sadness, the longing. It's achingly morbid. I'm drawn to it nonetheless, or my mind is at least. I think about how it would have felt, or if I would have felt anything at all when the moment came. I've imagined hundreds of versions of what he was going to do. Countless scenes that all end the same way. It was a night like any other. 
On cold January afternoons and bright June mornings, that thought sinks its way back into my thoughts, reminding me, whispering that safety is never guaranteed. I absentmindedly made a U-turn and turned my attention to the only door in the entire basement. Behind it lay nothing more than a storage room and my dad's workbench. This section of the basement isn't nearly as big as the main portion, but it's deceptively spacious. Upon entering the room, it doesn't appear much bigger than a walk-in closet. Push your way through the initial pile of boxes though, and a much bigger area reveals itself. Seemingly endless storage units, dusty tools, childhood keepsakes, and sports equipment that hadn't been used since the mid-90s. I vividly recall thinking to myself at that moment the place felt like a tomb, a resting place for all the cumulative odds and ends my family had gathered over the years. A sad place, but also kind of hopeful in a time capsule kind of way. That's when I saw it. Just a flicker of light for a fleeting moment. I let my thoughts consume my attention for about a minute, but I was feeling ready to give up on my basement inspection for the evening. As I turned to flip off the storeroom light, something caught my eye. I turned back to see a glimmering reflection, situated perfectly. Almost poetically between two stacks of old sports illustrated my brother used to collect. Time stopped. I didn't know what I was looking at, but I knew it wasn't right. As I squinted to try and see something, anything else in between the cracks and crevices of that room's cardboard jungle, he made his first mistake. What I had assumed was part of a shadow being cast by something else in the room suddenly shifted, and the glimmering speck shifted with it. At that moment, I didn't understand what I was looking at. I did not know I didn't want to be in that room anymore, though. Sometime between registering what I had just seen and my journey out of the room and up the stairs, my subconscious mind put together the pieces. What I thought was a shadow was really a leg and torso. The speck of light that caught my eye wasn't a random wrench or toy. It was a silver zipper slider wasn't alone down there. I was paralyzed with fear. I was always one of those people who would watch movies and yell at the characters for being so careless or stupid. If anything like that ever happened to me, I'll know exactly what to do, I would tell myself. In that moment, processing the reality of the situation paralyzed me. My semblance of a coherent plan or strategy seemed to crystallize and shatter as soon as it was formed. Overwhelmed by a degree of panic I had never even imagined, let alone experienced. The next two to five minutes are a blur. All I really remember is an alarm blaring in my head and repeating, Get out of the house or you are going to die. And oblivion. Cue nothingness. I believe in God. I believe I'll remain in some form after I die. I really do, but this... This was something else entirely. It came from deep within me. A visceral, almost animalistic panic for my physical being. Every cell in my body was screaming one word. Run. I didn't. It took about ten minutes of pacing beside my ajar front door for it to finally dawn on me. I have the upper hand. This guy thinks I didn't see him. He thinks we're still playing by his rules. I walked slowly to the kitchen and the house phone. A wave of relief washed over me as I picked up the phone. Game over, basement boy. The police will be here in minutes. That relief was quickly replaced by an onslaught of questions. Each one more terrifying than the last. How long had the phone line been cut? When was the last time the phone rang? What the fuck is happening right now? What other surprises does he have waiting for me? The advantage I had imagined moments earlier was flimsier than I thought. Douchebag came prepared. My mind kicked into overdrive. I darted upstairs and picked up my dead 2003 Nokia N-Gage. Frustrated but not surprised, I plugged it in. Two. Ten. Minutes. 
Those two words were bouncing around my head as I walked down the stairs, back toward the kitchen, and the door to the basement. My phone would turn on after charging for about 10 minutes, and this would be all over. Without ever consciously thinking or deliberating on it, I instinctually opened a drawer in the kitchen and pulled out the biggest knife in my mom's cutlery arsenal. It was a simple plan. Get through the next eight minutes, knife in hand, then call for help. I could do that. I had to do that. With just a few minutes left until it was time to go upstairs and check on my phone, I was starting to feel normal again. Considering the circumstances, that is, I calmed myself with a thought that he had no reason to leave the basement until late tonight once he thought I was asleep. I had just finished another set of deep breaths. Sitting there with a clear view of the basement door, I could almost convince myself in between moments that everything was fine. I faced the door from my side, allowing me just enough time to make a move undetected if he ascended the stairs and entered the kitchen constantly ask myself why I stayed. Sure, I had the advantage, but my chances were still far better down the street knocking on a neighbor's door frantically. I didn't have a logical explanation. Irrationally, I think I didn't want to give up my house to that asshole. There's no place the mind associates with security more than home, after all. Whenever we enter our homes, we know we're safe, surrounded by the comfort and security of all our worldly possessions nestled nicely between four walls and a roof. The situation was playing tricks on me. I was in my safe place, my childhood home, the place we all go running full speed back to in our dreams, night after night, year after year, no matter how long it's been gone, a home full of memories hopes, and dreams. But in that moment, all that nostalgia felt like quicksand. In a matter of hours, or maybe days, whoever he was had invaded my family's home and undone decades worth of love. No matter what happened next, I'd never feel safe again. Old houses always make strange noises. I must have said that to myself dozens of times in the 10 minute span of this all unfolding. With each creak, crack, and hum, my pulse jumped and my handle on the knife became just a little looser from the sweat pouring from my hands. From here, the details get hazier. Adrenaline has a way of overpowering the hippocampus. Without any warning at all, the door to the basement swung open. There he was, wearing all black, black gloves, Black boots, a dark blue mechanic shirt that read Derek in cursive on one side, but his face was clear to see. A scruffy beard and wild eyes. He looked young, but was covered in scars. He had a long, particularly nasty scar just under his left eye. Bigger than me, but not by much. 5'10 or 5'9, 170 pounds maybe. Obviously, he was scary. Within his eyes, I could immediately see that he was ready to hurt me. Yet there was something else hidden in his facial expressions. A fear. A deep, panicking fear. I sensed it immediately. Almost like I had just stumbled upon a wolf running from a bear. All that faded from my mind, though. As my eyes turned to his hands. One was holding a retro-looking video camera. You know the one. Every family had it in the 90s. In his other hand, he held a hammer. Before he had a chance to turn, I darted into the connecting dining room. Just out of sight, I heard the camera click on. What followed was the loudest silence I had ever experienced. He knows that I know, and he's coming for me right now. I thought to myself. I squeezed the handle of the knife like my life depended on it had analogy. With no time left to do anything else, I hid just behind the corridor wall. I could hear him muttering to himself nervously, but the sound of my own heartbeat drowned out any other distinguishable sound. He was slowly making his way around the room, 
Luckily for me, he decided to check out the opposite side of the kitchen. In his path lay a pantry door not far from the stove and a connecting outside door to our patio. I heard him open the pantry door and made my move. In a matter of quickness and ninja-like stealth, that's probably only possible in one's own home, I lunged across the connecting hallway, momentarily risking being seen, and made my way up the stairs as quietly as a ghost. Darting into my room, I grabbed my cell phone and hid in the closet. My old room had a two-door walk-in closet. The cultural familiarity of the situation wasn't lost on me. A scared girl hiding in her closet from some deranged killer. I felt like a caricature of myself. People say they keep expecting to wake up during unbelievable situations, but I knew I was awake. I've had scary dreams and nightmares, even a night terror or two during my first semester at college. This was different. The situation had robbed me of myself. I knew who I was, why I wanted to stay alive, the people in my life, my hopes and dreams for the future yet I couldn't actually grasp any of it. In that moment, I was a bug before the shoe came down, a deer before the hunter pulled the trigger. I stared at my cell phone and contemplated turning it on. Pro, I'll be able to call the police. Con, he'll definitely hear the startup chime when I turn it on and kill me before the cops get here. Decisions, decisions. As I was debating the right move, my decision was made for me. I swear my mind blocked out the footsteps at first, out of sheer denial. But soon enough, it was impossible to deny. He had climbed the stairs and was heading in my direction. I remember the darkness and the pitch black, waiting, listening to his footsteps growing gradually louder and closer. I remember the darkness. I wasn't thinking. I couldn't think. I knew on some conscious level he had entered the room. Only a thin layer of wood and some clothes on hangers separated us now. Just before what came next, I recall my heart actually slowed for a moment. I only noticed because I had grown accustomed to it beating like a bat out of hell. Then I heard his voice. Low, deep, and actually kind of smooth. If I had heard this voice in a crowded room or dimly lit bar, I might have been intrigued, like a lit sonic cigarette. At the time, I didn't realize it, but the very fact that he was speaking out loud must have meant he didn't know I was there. This will work, he said. A short sentence, but I knew what it meant. He must have assumed I had left when he heard the front door open a few minutes ago. He's up here looking for a new hiding place. He's coming in the closet. Within those next seconds, my mind revved back alive, and I knew what was coming. The memory is clouded by a surge of adrenaline, but I know the door opened and I lunged. As I moved, I screamed out something, but nothing close to an actual word. As I felt the knife enter his chest, I was shocked at how easily it seemed to slide in, just like the knife holder in the kitchen, like his torso was made for that blade. We both fell to the floor, and in the eternity between contact and landing, we must have been face to face, eye to eye, but all I could see was darkness. He let out a few whimpers and a hushed, fuck, but stopped moving beside the occasional twitch within moments. I jumped to my feet, flipped on the light, and saw a pool of blood and a body. I had stabbed him straight through the heart. His camera was still running and the hammer had landed on the other side of the room. Relief flowed all over me, and I started laughing out of sheer hysteria that I was still alive. I looked around my room, taking a few moments to admire my few remaining childhood toys. The stuffed bear I had won at the Columbus Day Fair ten years ago, and my elementary school diploma, which for some reason was still prominently displayed on my shelf, framed pictures of... Graduation days, summer barbecues, and old friends, all covered in a fine layer of dust. All the while, he was still in my peripheral sight, a mess of red, 
black, and pale skin. Finally, I looked down directly at him. The only thought in my mind was how scared he looked. Lost. Alone. Stuck like a pig and bleeding out on my rug. The rug I had played with dolls on as a girl. The rug I made out with Dylan Andrews on in the 8th grade. The rug I used to break down and cry on during lonely teenage nights. I don't know how much time passed, but before long I wasn't alone. First my parents, then the police. Questions, answers, statements, reports. It all came and went, but all the while I only had one question. Who was he? No one had any answers for me, and most of the police kept offering me coffee or a pat on the back. Congratulatory words that I was a tough girl and I really let him have it. My dad tried to get me to stop shaking by holding me, but somehow, it only made it worse. Derek, if that even is his real name, didn't have any wallet on him. In fact, he didn't have anything on him besides the camera, hammer, about $600 in cash and a business card for some production company in California. The police took it all. As the coroner zipped up the body, I took one more look at him. Now completely devoid of life, he emitted a kind of calmness that almost comforted me. That feeling didn't last long. As my eyes moved from his shoes upwards, I couldn't help but linger on his face. Someone had closed his eyes, thankfully, but somehow I still felt, still feel like he's looking at me. There are moments I don't feel his gaze, but they're few and far between. I can't count the number of nights Joe has comforted me after a nightmare. If only he knew I hadn't slept at all. Every time I close my eyes, I see him. In a way, though, I know it's all just a waiting game. I know I'll actually see him again. Not my imagination. Not a dream. Reality. One day I'll say goodbye to Joe, and everything else I've tried to build in this life, and he'll be the first thing I see. I know this to be true deep within my core. I feel it coming even as I write this. Until then, I'm only killing dead time, just a few steps ahead of what's always been coming. There's this tendency to keep going, just keep moving until it doesn't hurt anymore, closing myself off from everything. I don't even know who I used to be anymore, before he snuck underground and hid beside old board games and forgotten spare parts. I can't reach out and touch that version of myself. It's like watching a dimly lit movie in a smoky room. I know it happened. I swear it happened. But I don't feel it anymore. I don't feel it. And that's the scariest part. I win and you lose, asshole, but... What did I win? A lifetime's worth of questions asked in the span of 15 minutes. Why me? I find myself screaming that in my dreams more nights than I can count. I feel as dead as he is on the inside, but just like the drilling, I've learned to love the lie that I'm okay. Maybe he did kill me that night. I'm a walking funeral of my former self. I reach out to talk to her. Reminisce with her and I'm greeted by nothing but fading static images of his face, gasping for breath. I whisper over and over to him that I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry for him. I'm sorry that I had to do it. The house was sold three years later. I only visited a handful of times after Derek's visit and couldn't bring myself to ever spend the night ever again. I think that's a big part of what he did to me. I loved my home. I love the period of my life I spent there, and he took that from me. Some kids get to visit the place they grow up a few times a year. Mom and Dad stayed together and never sold the house. Some adults even still have their childhood room intact. Others aren't so lucky. Their childhood home is long gone. Maybe not literally, but certainly emotionally. In the end, though, we're all equally unequipped to touch the past yet perpetually doomed to relive it and replay it. 
Standing in your old room as an adult will never really feel like it did decades earlier. People tell me all the time to leave the past behind. Enjoy the present. Look toward the future. It's a noble thought, but it's as realistic as a fairy tale. You show me someone who's left the past behind, and I'll show you an infant. Your past defines you. It whispers desires and dreams to you in the night. You're nothing without your past. And it hurts, but it's all we have. A sea of nothing at all. And the past is always floating right there beside you like a rescue boat. Our oldest friend. And so much of our memories take place in our old homes. The details are never quite right, but the message stays consistent. The good old days. You give my emptiness a name, Derek. I just wish I knew who you were. Well, sometimes I do. Other times I want nothing more than to forget. Months later, I asked my dad if the police were ever able to ID Derek. He told me they checked his fingerprints, but there was no match in their system. Derek was buried in an unmarked grave. Anonymous. Forgotten. In moments of clarity, it dawns on me that I may be the only person even still thinking about him, still giving him life. Maybe it works both ways. The past moves us forward, but we also define the past. Forget it, and it's gone. Joe will be back soon. I'm tired of remembering, at least for one day.